Well, you hear this a lot from scientists. You hear this a lot in particular from female scientists. But the fact is that there are so, there is some reason to suppose that some that, uh, that, there, that there is an advantage to being a man in certain subjects. There's reason to suppose that gender essentialism, biological determinism, whatever you want to call it, the fact that there are male brains and female brains may indeed have some basis in science. Now, this is sort of thrown out of the window completely by by feminists and female academics who just refuse to accept that there, there's any reason whatsoever why, why there might be a gender imbalance. Two things on that. One, actually the science is very much still out on that. And two, if you look at equality in society, if you look, for example, at Bangladesh versus Norway, what you notice is the number of women in science and technology subjects actually goes down as societies get more equal because women simply don't make the same choices that female academics and feminists would like them to. Women actually don't want to go into the sciences um, on the whole, and when they have every option available to them, they tend to choose not to. If you're going to get put off a career in science because of an offhand comment from a Nobel Prize winner, um, how committed were you really in the first place to being That's a scientist? Ridiculous. Well, it's brilliant being a gay man because you can get away with murder. You can do anything. I mean, there's the one respect in which identity politics is brilliant. You know, um, as, a, as a gay man or a lesbian, you can basically get away with murder. You can be bitchy, you can be sarcastic, you can be rude and abusive, and you can do whatever the, whatever the hell you like, and nobody complains. Okay, so we have to ask. Girls is it, perform better at university. You have to ask if this is really a problem. More women are going to university. They're getting higher grades at school. They're getting higher grades at university. Twenty percent of all more women graduate. Women, women in their thirties earn more than men for the same work in their thirties in the UK and the US now. They are two to one more likely to get a job with the same qualifications. Where's the structural bias against women here? I don't see the problem here. What I do see actually is a very reasonable complaint from a lot of young men, not my generation maybe, you know, I'm sort of 10 years older than them, but from a lot of young men who are going to university, going into the workplace, and they don't recognize the world you're describing. But this is, this is based on an assumption that there ought to be some kind of gender parity. My suggestion is that there isn't. We don't complain when women dominate subjects like nursing. We shouldn't complain when men dominate subjects like physics. <laughs> I'm not from, well, I mean, Quebec is full of French people, so nothing could be worse than that. But uh, <laughs> the north of England is probably more like Detroit, maybe, or I, I don't know, somewhere really barren and hopeless and, and just sort of... In, <laughs> oh, in, God. Somewhere that's just yeah. in managed decline. Okay. You know? So I think the most important distinction is really between um, people who just want to be left alone to enjoy their hobby, um, consumers and, and, and fans of an entertainment medium, and, you know, these broken middle-class white train wrecks who have decided that the world is broken and they're the only people who can fix it. Well, uh, you know, these things don't even even survive a common sense test. Uh, they particularly mm -hmm. don't survive any kind of critical or academic inquiry. So, you know, you look at people like Christina Arf Summers at the American Enterprise Institute who very... Um, effectively and completely demolished most of these claims, whether it's the gender wage gap, which does not exist, whether it's the rape crisis of co uh, rape culture on campus, which does not exist. I'm a homo, so I don't really have a, um, uh, I don't have a dog <laughs> I didn't in know the... if you were just English or what. No, 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 both, both English and gay. That's why I sound so posh. Okay. No, um... You said you were a homo. So now I have to ask, uh, is, <laughs> is the Mariah Carey, is that the gay team Jersey for English people like Celine is for the, the gay people in Quebec? Yeah, I mean, it's just it's just signaling, really. You know, I mean, always, I you know, I I sort of I say I like her. I have no idea if I really do. <laughs> uh, I should, who knows? No, no. Well, you you're missing it. Terrible homosexual. I'm a terrible homosexual. <laughs> uh, you know, I'm such a failure as a gay man. I grew up watching Star Trek. I'm sorry. No, it's called the Cotton Ceiling, and it describes the inherent transphobia that all cisgendered people have against transsexuals. It basically is a tr it's a tra a transgender campaigner's way of saying if you don't want to have sex with me, you're transphobic. Um, and it's called the cotton ceiling, supposedly, because nobody gets past the panties. So we don't cut off the arms of people who wake up one day and say, this arm doesn't belong to me. So we shouldn't warp reality to conform to delusion. Um, we should instead try to help that person reconcile their, their okay. body with their mind. If you accept, as the left insists that we now do, that you can be born with the wrong gendered brain, that blows out of the water gender as a social construct. And gender as a social construct has been the central linchpin of the majority of left-wing sexual thinking for the last 40 years. If you throw out the idea that gender is a social construct, you throw out the idea of that, that all gender roles are just performative and learned behavior, and mm -hmm. you accept that somebody can be born with the wrong brain, a man can be born with a woman's brain, that upsets the apple cart for the left um, right. more, th more than I can really explain to you in the point. confines of this program. Because what it does is suggest that all of the wars they've been fighting, all of the sexism stuff they've been talking about, all of the sort of don't tell me I can't behave like X because I'm a woman is rubbish.
what it does is suggest that everything that they've been arguing for the last 30 years is total hokum. So the left has got to pick one because you can't hold both of these positions simultaneously. Right. You cannot say there is such a thing as a female brain and at the same time say that all female behavior is learned and is social and therefore we should stop complaining that women uh, about women who don't want to be feminine and we should we should say it's okay for men to be metrosexuals and all the rest of it. My view is it isn't. So I'm very tempted by this I'm very tempted by this new position that I'm being encouraged That's into That's a very by, good point. I mean, aside from the gigantic volumes of domestic violence in lesbian relationships, they're all kicking the crap out of each other all day long. Lesbians? Um, yes, yes, yes. Lesbian relationships. So the statistics on lesbian domestic violence are astonishing. I believe they're, that entirely from my anecdotal experiences at Bass well, Pro. Ev <laughs> everybody knows this to be true. Anyone who's ever pretended to enjoy women's football and shown up to a match and seen what they get onto, or seen what they get up to on the pitch. I mean, you know, so anyone who's got a very left wing friend who's had to go and pretend to find women's football. I have to, the dumpstick doesn't lie. Sort of. I mean, we don't have any good sports. I mean, we have soccer for God's sake. I mean, you know, we we invented a couple of decent things, but no, American national sports by far the best. Thank Real you so football. much for saying that. Real football, baseball, basketball. Like I can't get enough of any of them. They're, Not a soccer fan. They are. No, God, it's for oh, God, soccer's for gays. I mean, you know, the matches go on forever. This is so boring. My God, the only reason to watch football is to admire the men, which and that, therefore it mystifies me that the audience is mostly male because what are they all doing for ninety minutes? It's so boring. No, 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 no. I can't deal with any of that. I'm, I'm, I'm American sports all, all the way. If if there's any overarching theme in my work, the Gamergate stuff, the transgender stuff, it's. The, my primary objection to authoritarian left is that it is profoundly anti-intellectual. Anti it is profoundly and determinately purposefully stupid. It does not permit discussion and debate of the most interesting and important things in human life, the most important philosophy, the most important politics, the most important stuff that, that, that defines us and that helps us to relate to the world around us. It will not have those discussions. That's what I hate about it. That's what I think it, it really robs ordinary people of um as, you know that's that's what i think is the real the real objection aside from any specific stupid argument they make so <laughs> homo bears they sound delicious they yeah. taste a little taste a little salty <laughs> like you know if i if i wasn't homosexual i'd be a huge homophobe i was told my whole life that i was going to experience homophobia that it was going to be the worst thing that's ever going to happen to me that you know that the left was going to protect me i've never met a homophobe well they probably and, cut look, a wide swath well i Sure, but I mean, you know, I, I don't think I've ever met one. I don't think I've ever been anywhere where somebody has threatened, you know, has has wanted to hit me. I don't think it's ever cost me anything in business dealings. I just don't think I've ever met one. Now, granted, I'm, you know, I run in in fairly civilized circles, but if anything, uh, there, are, you know, there are plenty of socially conservative people in those circles who, who you know, would have problems. I don't think I've ever met a, a sort of virulently homophobic. Person. Well, that's why I say because I, I would think it's nonsense. I I'm, I, I don't date whites, which I suppose puts me in the um, really sort of the, the, the ultimate conservative sin bin. You only date black people? Yeah. So the good news is, if you're redheaded, it is true that fewer people are going to be attracted to you. But the ones that are don't care what you look like. Exactly. So you, you can get fat and you will always find people who want to fuck you. I, I, I don't mind coming out as gay. I don't even mind more dip, more much more difficult coming out as conservative, but coming out as a Trekkie is a step too far, even oh, for gosh. me. Can you put to rest the myth of this, the BBC being this beacon of truth and light in news? Oh, it's hideous. It's a monstrous engine of, of, of uh, liberal chaos. Yeah, and there's something of a sort of elderly antiques dealer about that, you know? Um, <laughs> so is I, that I, a I, gay I, thing, antiques? Yeah. Is that a joke? I, well, I know, I know. There's an actual phobia of antiques, more so than homophobia. There is a clinical what? phobia. Yeah, Robert, uh, uh, Billy Bob Thornton. There is no clinical phobia of antiques. That's ridiculous. It's just attention seeking. And um, <laughs> yes, of course, get antiques are. Get How many straight people do you know that work in antique shops? I don't know anybody who works. In no, an no. Shop. Well, if you did, they would be gay. No, I've always I've always wondered about which the um you know sort of there are not enough women working in tech there aren't enough you know blacks in this or whatever I've always wanted to start a petition for heterosexuals on fragrance counters um you know why then why aren't there more straight men selling perfume uh, it must be because of structural oppression and um and sort of society's prejudices about what roles men can take in society. Mustn't it? Because after all, that's the explanation for all of the other absences in, in every other industry. So, you know, we've all been there, right? As, as homosexuals, we've all played the straight, you know, we all sort of tried to pretend to be straight for the first couple of days in a new job, just so that all of the other gays are like, oh, I really want to bang that. And then as soon as they find out you're gay, they're like, oh, okay, whatever, honey. This is what I, I firmly believe that God made me gay so that I could go for the jugular with feminists and I've got cover.
You know, I firmly believe I was made a homosexual just as cover, just as an identity politics distraction, like a mister a, 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 a misdirection maneuver, um, just to throw them at the beginning. So they meet me and they're like, "Oh, it's this nice gay guy. He's going to be fine." And then I'm like, "The facts are wrong." <laughs> you know, like I could stick up for straight guys in a way they could never stick up for themselves. If- I have a I have a, a theory that gay emancipation has made society more stupid, and the reason is, that is as follows. That's the lead. Uh, yeah, <laughs> yeah. Gay size. I haven't written this up yet, actually. So you can't steal this. So I'm going to write it up at some point. I shan't. Um, the the reasoning goes something like this: uh, We know that IQ, which for all its faults, is still the best measure of intelligence that we have. Mm-hmm. Um, it's probably the best um, indicator of future success, and it's a pretty good indicator of um, you know whether somebody will perform, perform well in a globalized information economy. It's not a terrible measure of intelligence, right? Is at least sixty to eighty percent heritable. We also know that. Gay people, men who identify as homosexual for the majority or for all of their lives, test significantly higher than the rest of the population for IQ. Nobody knows why. We don't know if it, being gay makes you smarter or being smarter makes you gay or whether they're just um, gene clusters that tend to occur together. But what used to happen in the 50s is that gay men would get married, have kids, and then have a double life. They would live their, their you know, dirty, nocturnal, um, alternative existence, and they would... Play, play house. They would have happy, you know, play happy families during the day. That doesn't happen anymore. What's happened in the short, in, in, in really the space of just two generations, is that between two and five percent of the smartest men aren't breeding anymore because they tend to adopt um, or they tend to have, you know, kids from other places. They don't tend to have their own genetic children anymore. And if you believe the upper limit estimates of homosexuality in the population was 4%, something like that, you bear in mind that most women breed, but most men don't. Um, it's quite a significant impact on the hereditary uh, uh, IQ that's moving from generation to generation. And it's one of the one, many ways in which gay emancipation is, you know, uh, most people would agree is probably... A good thing in most respects but the fact that gays are now able to you know that are liberated and able to live their lives uh, freely and openly means they breed less now um, and as a result there's a lot there are a lot fewer of the smartest men having children but you it's, prompt- my, it's my debate strategy you see you just lay down machine gun fire and by the end of it people are just like uh-huh yeah as a comedian <laughs> Well, this is part of a broader. Uh, it's part of a broader trend. Basically, people don't know anything. Um, people are absolutely wrong about everything. What? It would have been. It would have been un- unconscionable for me to ever consider hitting a woman when I was growing up. But I see Jessica Valenti on the screen, and you know, hmm. <laughs> <laughs> don't ever get us in a TV studio together. You even think. even I can't hit. I mean, not saying I want to, but even I wouldn't get away with hitting a, a woman um, being gay because the the male privilege would override the homosexual oppression in that particular case. Normally, right. I can get away with being outrageous and saying unpleasant things and being controversial. Oh, you know, he's just a faggot. But um, <clears throat> but I, I couldn't I couldn't do that. So, if, so I like to make a joke out of being a, a sort of homophobic homosexual. So it's kind of like a it's kind of a, a, a joke that I that I do. Um, so I just latch onto any sort of derogatory word for homosexual because it annoys the right kind of gay. Um, you know, there's an earnest kind of pearl clutching glad kind of you know like, <gasps> how can you say that about your own people? And then of course they accuse you of being self loathing and all the rest of it. And I, I find this sort of stuff endlessly funny. So if any Anybody's offended by that word. I'm sorry, but um, yeah, well, actually, no, I'm not. If anyone's offended, ironically, by that, get that someone has caught me. Yourself. But even more important than that, we need gender equality so that boys won't be violent. There's a wonderful charity based in Edinburgh called Zero Tolerance, which is teaching gender equality to childminders so that they can teach children that they're equal, they have equal opportunities, and they do it specifically to reduce violence from men to women when they're adults. We need to start much earlier than men. Okay, Milo, you want to come in? Unbelievable, astonishing sexism. Mm. We have to teach teach young boys not to be boys so they won't be violent. Why is being yeah. violent being... Get out. Get out. Why? I'm sorry. Like, gender, you know, we, we teach boys and girls that they're, that they're um, the same and that's a, uh, that's a problem. They are different. When we, do, when we do experiments on young babies and um, e- even on re- related animals, we know yeah, that certain that children go for certain true. toys. Boys and girls Those are different. To give you some context for all of this... Um, 
you have to understand a little bit about the history of feminism. Um, there have been two main strands. And of here feminism. is our local expert. <laughs> well, yes. <laughs> <laughs> oh, of course, I've, because of course men aren't allowed to speak about anything that isn't to do well, with no, men. Except no one's really said. interested. Yeah. In yeah. Let him talk. Sure. Already said. Yeah. Indicate that you know nothing about All right, well, it. So, I'm so going you, to, you've already you've already. I'm going to talk to you a little. Okay. I'm going to talk to you a little bit okay. about the problems that men are experiencing in society. And since you're not a man, perhaps you could like to um, give it a rest for a second. Um, <laughs> so there is a, a wider context in which um, men are suffering slightly. Even 10 years ago, it would have been ridiculous to say it. Um, but very recently, um, we've seen a lot of structural advantages to being a woman crop up in education in the workplace. Under 30, um, women earn more than men for the same work in the UK and the US now, which is an extraordinary statistic and something that you know, people have to be very, very uh, carefully convinced of because it sounds, sounds absurd. But there is a sense in which um, men, particularly young men, probably men our age mm. haven't necessarily experienced it, but younger men, 20-year-olds, um, there's an enormous problem, I read about this last year, um, I call it the sexiness, of men checking out of society, checking out of relationships, giving up on women, giving up on um, careers. They don't bother to go to university anymore. Now more women go to university, women get higher grades at university, more women graduate from university. Yeah. All of the traditional um, imbalances between men and women have flipped, and very recently. No, that's and when young men, you go may I be allowed to finish? Business, Sorry, I'm, talk I'm talking correct. about men, darling. Um, when and and you call them darling, how incredibly yeah. and now you think it's funny. Well, well, this yes. is exactly well, we, the problem. We this heard, is we institutionalised heard, we, sexism, oh, and you're dear. just sitting here doing it flagrantly and without even apologising. Well, we just, we just, just heard that it, we just heard that it was so, an essential characteristic so, of men that they were violent a minute ago. So no, I guess we did not. We did not. Nobody That's said exactly what that. you said. So it's now open saying. season, particularly if you're white and you're a man. And what feminists don't seem to appreciate the irony of is that they are relentlessly ridiculing people on the basis of skin colour and sex, no, and they don't seem to get the irony there. For our lesbian friends, or any men in the audience, or as I like to call them, eunuchs, you might like to consider scissor fingers, which is a fairly simple one. Um, you have to kind of lift it up in the air to really get the full effect, but basically you just sort of lean back a little bit and just do this. Finally, a perennial feminist favourite, something you won't even have to teach your audience. It's finger wagging. I think it's pretty clear, unfortunately, that it comes down to an issue of personal responsibility. No cloud service is ever going to be completely secure. Apple does have a responsibility to make its software as secure as possible, but there will always be hackers who are much smarter and much cleverer um, and are much more determined to exploit vulnerabilities. What this boils down to, for celebrities just like everybody else, is personal responsibility. And if you're going to take pictures of yourself like that, by far the most intelligent thing to do is do it with a Polaroid. Don't do it on a device that's connected to the internet, that's sending your pictures to servers you don't control. It's a, recipe for, it's a recipe for madness. And for somebody who is as rich and as famous as Jennifer Lawrence is, um, you know, it's, it's sort of unbelievable. It's really weird, isn't it? I mean, um, we keep hearing about all of these extraordinary hate crimes that, that happen everywhere, but it doesn't really, I don't think, uh, reflect the Britain that most of us know and love. The, the problem really, I think, is that um, there's a whole ecosystem of publicly funded uh, think tanks and university um, de, you know, departments and, and all the rest of it, all, all set up to find prejudice somewhere um, to justify their own existence. I mean, it doesn't, it doesn't reflect the country that, um, that I know, and I don't think it reflects most people's experiences of being gay. Well, I grew up in a very small village in Kent, um, and I can tell you that actually, you know, people who live in the country, who grow up in, you know, in rural places in England are some of the most tolerant, some of the most welcoming, some of the loveliest people in the country. In fact, it's in the city that I have personally experienced more, uh, I guess, uh, oppression or victimization, because I don't think they really exist in Britain anymore, but certainly where I've experienced the most problem for being gay. And ironically, it's not really for being gay at all. It was much more difficult to come out as a, as a Tory voter being gay than it was, you know, my sexuality in the first place. And that was a result of the sort of gay establishment, which is now using very much the same sort of uh, um, you know, tactics that they, they say that they were uh, subjected to themselves over decades. I don't think it really reflects um, Britain. And I think you know, it's easy to get caught up in the hysteria and drama about uh, you know, homophobia. It's not really a problem anymore in this country, in the same way that it's patronizing and out of date to say that women are some sort of oppressed minority or oppressed underclass in this country. It simply isn't true anymore. Well, I lived in a small community and I was noticeably different. I remain noticeably different. The problem with hate crimes, first of all, is they're far too broadly defined. Second of all, it's a sort of Orwellian attempt to get inside the minds of, of people involved in altercations and work out what their real motivations were. Um, and thirdly, in fact, it sort of destroys the concept of equality before the law because effectively what hate crime means is it's more of a crime to hit 
let's say, me, than it would be to hit you, which is something that I think most of your viewers would probably disagree with the principle of. Um, you know, it's an absurd thing to try to get into the minds of people, work out what they were really motivated by and what they were really doing. And these, this is the problem we're seeing at the moment in the US with the, um, the shooter, this terrible um, uh, atrocity in Charleston. Um, people trying to get into his, into his mind and work out what, we, what he was really motivated by. The fact is, we'll never know. He was crazy. Um, lots of people get into fights all the time, but if you provide people with this ready-made victimhood script, um, they're quite willing, they, they will be quite willing to use it. And unfortunately, gay people do get into fights, and when they get into fights, they you know, have a habit of crying foul and crying homophobia in the same way that, um, unfortunately, lots of, of um, other kinds of minorities have sort of been trained into doing as well because they know it gets results. Like every sort of rightsist movement in its death throes, the um, discussion gets ever more hysterical and focused on ever smaller things. So if you look at sort of the gender war, you look at modern feminism, they start to focus on ever more tiny things, but ever more hysterically. So we see, for example, obsession over transgender pronouns um, to the point of hysteria and mania, to the point of, of pursuing people if they don't use them properly. We see, you know, um, discussion about man spreading, which is this, this thing in New York, apparently men sit with their legs too wide on the tube. And it's spoken about with an extraordinary sort of ferocity and hatred, like this was something that actually mattered. I mean, never mind the women who put their handbags and shopping on the seats. You know, this sort of weird, obscure, tiny um, stuff that is spoken about enormously angri angrily is the sign of a movement in its death throes, panicking okay. because it's worried about perpetuating its own existence. Um, well, the Office for National Statistics figures are based on 1% of an average right the way across the industry, so they don't take into account the different kinds of jobs people are doing, so really they're um, uh, effectively meaningless. But there's a very simple question that, show, that demonstrates why this, um, the whole debate is nonsense and why the pay gap is, is, ridi is a ridiculous um, sort of fabrication. And it's this, if women are working, are doing the same work for, for less money, why aren't companies full of women? Why aren't employers going out actively seeking women? Well, they don't, and they don't for some of the same reasons that, um, that you know, women take different sorts of roles and different part-time roles. Women don't work as long hours as men do, even if they don't have children. They take longer holidays. They don't make as much money for their firms. They don't work the same overtime. Um, so we can't really expect them to be compensated the same as men when they don't work as hard. Now, that's not, uh, you know, I don't, mean, I don't mean that to sound, uh, you know, I'm a kind about women. Women simply have different um, priorities in life. Most women want a more balanced life they want time with their family they want to do to it, hobbies they want more time away on holiday they don't want to put in the, the work that those sort of uh, obsessive aggressive um, you know uh, 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 sort of goal-oriented male professions sometimes demand the law for example um, women just aren't really interested in devoting their whole life to work in that way um, and the, the very broad brush figures from the ONS simply reflect that what they don't show is that a woman going to the workplace is going to be paid less than a man for the same in fact under the age of 35 in the UK and the US, women are paid more in the same sorts of roles and they're two to one more likely to get jobs in science and maths because employers are so desperate to hire women. No, it doesn't matter in the sense that they are equal but different, but it simply isn't true to say that there is no difference whatsoever between the aptitudes of men and women. And it is um, without question true that there are some biological differences between men and women, and we know that from our anatomy. Um, but we also know it from experiments uh, that we do on young children before they've had the opportunity to be socialised, the sorts of toys that they go for. And that holds true actually for other bits of the animal kingdom as well. Some of the reason why girls drop out um, of STEM subjects at college and and uh, chess clubs is because they keep losing and one of the reasons they keep losing is that it does seem to be the case that chess as a game plays to some of the male intellectual virtues and when Simon Baron Cohen talks about these he's, he, the way he describes it is um, men are good at systematizing and women are good at empathizing and there is some reason to suppose that that may have some bio, uh, basis in biology it's very trendy these days to say that everything is socially determined but that's not what the science says and it's not either what common sense says because if it were true these days Days, there would be a lot more representation of women in the sciences, in astrophysics, in philosophy, in mathematics, and in chess, but there isn't. We're into sort of, you know, broader left-wing territory here where the Educational maintenance, allow uh, maintenance Allowance, the EMA, i.e. bribing children to go to school, well, you, on, just, what you, about described the as, on... you just described as a basic right, which I think most ordinary people would find ridiculous. Okay, what about racing? I mean, you know, those of us who perhaps have right of centre views but are in, under, you know, no stretch of the imagination racist, I mean, my dating history looks like, a, you know, a Benetton catalogue. Um, you know, I'm, I'm not a racist person, but I, I do think that there, there is some... I, I can understand people who are concerned that sexism and racism legislation, when it gives rise to positive discrimination, affirmative action, quotas and stuff like that, 
unfairly discriminates against certain groups okay. of people. And I just Britain, don't accept the argument that Britain's racist. Okay, let me... Well, it's extraordinary, isn't it, to hear about, you know, the, the fact that there's apparently a problem with women wor 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 worrying about being too thin. That's, of course, not the problem. Wor the problem is that everyone's getting too fat. And actually, there's no evidence, really, that any of this stuff has much of an impact. A lot of the science is very fuzzy on this. It's social science stuff rather than any, any real sort of uh, reports or anything. I mean, what... What worries me about all of this kind of stuff is the implication that um, somehow we're going to make people's lives happier or better um, by encouraging them to believe that whatever body shape they are and whatever they look like, they're beautiful and they're going to be happy. That's, evident, that's quite clearly not the case. I mean, if you look at women's, women's happiness has been going down uh, since the Second World War, actually. Every decade, women are getting more miserable as they get told that they can be who they want and look how they like. And, and you can say... I suppose that a woman's uh, self-esteem should have nothing to do with whether or not a man's sexual preference, you know, sort of coincides with how she looks. But the fact is, women are getting more unhappy, and this sort of um, slightly irresponsible trend to sort of encourage people to eat whatever they want and do whatever they want is what's, you know, is one of the things that's fueling an obesity crisis. And that's a really serious thing. That's a real thing. That's something that's got health implications. It's got cost implications for the NHS. The problem isn't too many anorexic women. The problem is quite in the opposite direction. We're perfectly happy to have uh, aspirational role models. Uh, in our entertainment. We should have them too in our retail. There's nothing wrong with encouraging people to live healthily. I'm not sure where this sort of obsession with realism and realistic proportions has come from. I mean, you can, there, there are blogs, there are feminist blogs out there that show, you know, video game characters in more realistic proportions. They turn... Uh, uh, Lara Croft into this sort of dumpy, lesbianic, uh, you know, short woman in cargo pants. And nobody really wants to see that. Nobody wants, not even women. It's not an aspirational like, uh, our sort of icon that people can aspire to be like. The fact is, we, have, we do have a huge problem with people treating their own health very irresponsibly. And I personally find when, when media figures and feminists and, and activists and campaigners encourage women to worship themselves no matter what their size and what their shape, actually that just has the effect of making women unhappy. And women have been getting more unhappy decade after decade after decade since the Second World War, since this stuff started to happen. I'm not sure that's the case. I think it's quite an important part of growing up, that sort of, uh, as people start to um, you know, experiment with dangerous language, they argue with each other, they position themselves against yeah, other people. And if you provide them with these enormous words on, main, you know, on mainstream TV news stations, because you've written in national newspapers, these awful naughty words, what's a kid going to do? Use it. I'm going to read out something you wrote about homosexuality, oh God. which is the feelings of... The feelings of of alienation and rejection it engenders are responsible for the sorts of repugnant tribal posturing you see on the streets of Soho on a Friday night as bitterly unhappy queers engage in degrading and repulsive behaviour. I stand by that. It's, uh, okay. Um, <laughs> I'm really not that much of a homosexual. I mean, you know, I don't even like them. I don't like them. If I, if I, if I were straight, I would be the biggest homophobe. I swear. Um, you know, like, I, I don't even like them very much. I'm not a libertarian because, you know, a lot of my friends are libertarians. I, 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 so many of my friends and colleagues are libertarians. But I sort of think, you know, it's all well and good until you realize that, you know, actually it'd be better if your daughter did not grow up to be a crack whore. But the other thing about libertarians is, you know, or on the whole, libertarians are such children. They're, they're obsessed with two things. They're obsessed with weed and hacking and all they ever want to hear about is like where the next eighth is coming from and Edward bloody Snowden um, this is all they have to talk about all they want to talk about weed and hacking weed and hacking I mean it's sort of perpetually 17 it drives me insane I mean just, libertarianism is you know, it's some great intellectual uh, philosophical sort of history and heritage of this movement classical, classical liberalism J.S. Mill and all the rest of it and all they want to talk about is weed and hacking I mean, it just drives me up the, up the wall because there's some really useful and interesting things that they could say about the proper limits of government but they never do I'm guessing that you you, Dean, is not obsessed with weed or hacking, but, no. um, you know, but, but, this is, but, this is, but this is the impression I always get from the libertarian. I'm more skeptical about same-sex marriage, mostly because I think it makes homosexuals really boring. I mean, the only good thing about being gay was, you know, it was being able to sort of break all the rules, stumble out of a club bleary-eyed at 4 p.m. on a Monday afternoon, and nobody could judge you. Um, you know, it was a good thing about being gay. It's a gay marriage. They want to, this, is, this is just society's way of controlling dissident subcultures. You know, they just want to sort of settle down, get a house and a car and adopt a child and have a terrible nine-to-five job and become just like everyone else. I mean, you know, being gay, you could grow up being gay it's pretty awful it's pretty you know it's confusing you feel you know miserable half the time yeah, I, i've never been the victim of any sort of 
know, unpleasantness, but you know, gen- generally it's not a sort of happy way to be. Your reward for that is for the rest of your life you get to behave terribly <laughs> and nobody can say anything. Um, you know, this sort of gay marriage is incredibly depressing. I think it's awful for gay, uh, gay culture in general has become so sort of bourgeois and depressing and, and miserable. Um, you know, so I, I'm not I'm not a fan of that. And when you see things like the memories pizza, um, you know, these, these sort of poor pizza shop owners who get uh, hectored and pilloried and bullied into closing down their store because they don't want to make a cake for lesbians. I mean, you know, who would endorse lesbian marriage? You know what, you know what the domestic violence rate is for lesbians? I mean, just, you know, uh, it's, it's a... I actually they, they, I they don't. They beat the crap out of each other all the... No, they beat the crap out of each other all the time. I mean, you know, I can, I can well imagine if I owned a cake shop. I'm not making you a cake. You're just going to end up on her face. If you look at the statistics on lesbian domestic violence, you can look up an article that I wrote for Breitbart, which is called Attack of the Killer Dykes. Um, and basically, you look... <laughs> I'm just making your life worse now. No, I'm sorry. Um, basically, the culture wars, which we're familiar with, you know, feminists and, um, you know, uh, authoritarians of all stripes who want to clamp down on creative freedom, tell people that art forms make people sexist and violent and racist and all the rest of it. Um, no evidence for any of this. It's all crazy. Finally, these wars arrived in video games last year. And so um, gamers, unlike any other fandom, unlike comic books, fantasy, sci-fi, all of whom have toppled over and taken it and started self-flagellating about, you know, what an awful diversityless, you know, terrible straight white male patriarchal kind of pursuit this is. Gamers said, you know what, actually no, wait, you're wrong about this. We're hugely diverse. We're very welcoming. There is no evidence that video games make anybody more violent, more sexist, or anything else. Get out of get out of our hobby. We're not interested in your political warfare in something that we love. We, we in, you know, which we do precisely to escape from this kind of nonsense in the rest of the world. And so that's basically it. Uh, it's a sort of pitched battle between ordinary gamers on the one hand, and on the other, um, um, you know, the ranked masses of the media, all of whom bought this line about them being misogynistic losers, um, you know, feminist, feminist sort of critics and academics, and, uh, you know, basically the whole the establishment, and on the, you know, on, on the virtuous side was gamers and me. <laughs> I never call them back in the morning. Don't spread scandalous lies. <laughs> Rick Perry, I would say, total homo. Um, really? No, okay, Facebook. I wasn't going to Rick Perry. Now you're going off, I was going to say Al Gore. I've always thought Al Gore was gay. Oh, no, 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 no. He's so unfashionable. Um, no, no, no. He's, he's just, he has no personal style whatsoever. He has nothing. I mean, you know, Rick Perry's got a certain swagger. You know, Rick, Rick so you can sort of tell Rick might. Yeah, maybe. No, but Al Gore is way too unfashionable to be homosexual. We will not accept him. We will not have him. He's, he's not getting in. Hillary Clinton. What do you think? You think she could? Uh... Well, do you, I think she's a lesbian? Yeah. Ooh. Well, she's. Yeah. You know what? She's got that sort of cold steel behind the eyes that a lot of them have, hasn't she? She's got the terrible. She's pizza, got the devil's pizza, eyes. One size too small. <laughs> no. Do you know what I mean? That sort of those dead fish eyes. You know. Yeah. Just sort of, or maybe bird eyes. They're just doll's sort of, there's eyes. That, there's, there's like, you know, there's something, something of the ineffable. The sort of endless abyss behind those eyes of cold, dark. Uh, sociopathy, um, and it's sort of you see quite often in lesbians. I, I don't know, maybe <laughs> I don't know some... where this idea ever came from. Gays and lesbians get along, we like each other, we hate each other. Um, no, I. It's like werewolves and she... vampires. Yeah, <laughs> it's just, <laughs> right. Yeah, I mean, she, yeah, no, I mean, the lesbians and housewarming gifts are always very dangerous. You know, you give her the verbena instead of the vanilla. I mean, it's bad. You, you just end, you'll, you'll end up served for dinner. You know, there are scary people. I was like, you know what was what? worse about it is, I mean, it's uh, and this is Gavin McInnes's point. She said, uh, "You know, cut that out, sir. You're going home in an ambulance." Nobody goes home in ambulances. That's like you talk. Ambulance takes you home. <laughs> Your ambulance takes you home. Something has gone wrong. You're going to go home in a hearse, little guy. <laughs> I mean, it's, it's Gavin McInnes's joke, but it's a good point. Uh, good joke. <laughs> Well, you know, some people say that, that transgenderism is, um, is a psychiatric disorder that ought to be in the DSM somewhere near, for example, bipolar and narcissistic uh, personality disorder. Yeah. Um, and they get very upset when you say this. But, you know, just look at the prominent transsexuals and even, even not prominent. If you happen to know any personal life, I, mean, I, I, I know one, you know, and tell me that they don't have a touch of NPD about them. I mean, these, you know, these people uh, have a, crave attention more than they crave, you know, surgery. I mean, it's, 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 it's an extraordinary thing. They do, they do seem broken that way. What worries me more is that we're creating this sort of privileged class of victims, I think, in America, um, where if you belong to a particular group or you have a certain disease, you can basically get away with saying anything. So there's a satirist, a great satirist called Godfrey Elf, who's a sort of social media satirist, and he takes the piss out of yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, feminists. Anyway, he's, he's absolutely great, and you must follow him. But um, he, sort of, he tweeted her, because he, he likes to go, to, go to sort of very left-wing celebrities 
celebrities um, pretending to agree with their points of view. So they sort of get locked into conversation and then he drops bomb on them. But um, he, he sort of, he referred to um, Ben Shapiro as a neo-Nazi or, or to Ben Shapiro and to his supporters as a neo-Nazi. And she replied, agree. Um, <laughs> and you're like, hang on a second. I'm pretty sure when you had your hand around his shoulder, I saw a Yamolka. Um, you know, like, I'm pretty sure he's not a neo-Nazi. Just, just going to throw that out there. Um, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it, but you, this, is, this is an. I mean, if somebody else called a prominent Jewish journalist a neo-Nazi, I mean, you can't even imagine what the result would be. The trajectory of pressure is only ever in one direction, and that's because, for example, the, the same people who um, want all of you know, women to be allowed into men's spaces and want to be able to take over men's sports are the same people who are complaining that women's football is less highly remunerated. Well, it's less high, highly remunerated because it's incredibly fucking dull, uh, <laughs> enormously boring. I disagree with you. I disagree with you. I, I, like fact, well, you soccer, Kate, I hate soccer, but I think soccer is a woman's you're, sport. Uh, it's just the same as the men, so I, it's it's a wash to me. Well, uh, well, I agree with you in general. It is a it is a sport for girls um, but you know there are boy girls and girl girls and the boy girls are faster and better and they make more money and that's perfectly reasonable but yeah no you never you never see people who want um, you know uh, boys injected into girls sports of course they of course they don't you well do you know it. about the hockey thing right like the women's uh, uh, the American women's Olympic hockey team plays high school hockey teams and loses high yeah. school boys hockey team and loses oh. they consider it to be really tough preparation for the women for the Olympic competitions the women's olympic hockey team play like high school boys and and lose but they think they, that's basically the best team they can find to play against and that's a it's ring called, full it's called testosterone it's a ring full of <laughs> yeah but it's, it's, i didn't believe that when i first read it but it's absolutely true uh, my son is 15 so i clearly have had sex at least once at least once this is true <laughs> you broke you broke my heart <laughs> <laughs> milo was just hoping sure. I was sure he was a homeless. I mean, did you see that outfit? I mean, did you see the outfit? And come on, Terry Hatcher is a gay guy's idea of what a beautiful woman is like. <laughs> She's absolutely beautiful. But if a gay, man was, to, I'm if super a gay man was asked to describe the most beautiful woman in the world, he would describe Terry. I mean, we just, you know, that, that's, that, that's, that's what it is. Literally, she has so many gay fans from, from Desperate Housewives, and they're all homosexual. So obviously, you know, the outfit, the spandex, Terry Hatcher, really gay. But no. <laughs> no, no. See, it's my, my, my early, my teenage gaydar was not as refined then as it is now. Yeah. 